evening. I hope everyone is getting this because when I logged in, it was saying YouTube was having trouble uh, with the lives. So I'm hoping everyone can hear this. If not, I'll just carry on anyway. And I'll just, yeah, it's saying YouTube has got a problem. And I'll see if I can get it to get on. No. No, it's just on Twitter at the moment. It's not letting me go live on YouTube. That's a pain. YouTube, you need to sort yourself out. Anyway, I've got my Twitter, so I'm okay. I can always upload it when I finish this live. I'll just upload it, and if they want to watch it, then they can watch it then. But for some reason, it's not letting me go live. As soon as I get the go ahead, I'll go live on YouTube. It's not letting me go live at the moment. And ever occurred, wait a moment and try again. Let's see what's showing on YouTube. You know, YouTube is experienced. You no, know, it's not coming up as live. You know, right. Okay, sorry about that anyone on YouTube, when you're watching it on replay, not my fault, it's YouTube, YouTube's got the problem, not me. Anyway, um, 44 days now with Sebastian, there's still no sign of him, no sightings of him, nothing. But I've come across a few videos, right? And we're going to have a look at them. One of them is a very interesting one, and I would advise anyone to go and watch that themselves because it is a long one. So I'm not really going to show that one. I'll just talk about it because it's a long one, and I think showing it on here i wouldn't give it any justice you need to go and watch it yourself the link is in the description so if you're on twitter please no it's not letting me if you're on twitter please go along and view it it's by peter hyatt and it's really good it's really really good um i have got the link to seth rogers cash app and the GoFundMe link in the description if you've got your hand and perhaps you haven't got a cash app like me i don't then please donate to going along and going out on the GoFundMe. Uh, what else was there? I think. Anyway, still suffering with a cold, which I cannot get rid of. I think if I haven't got cleared it by Monday, I'll phone the doctors and go see the doctor, see if they can give me some. I don't know, it might be a cold. They're wrong about that bird flu, aren't they, in New York? I don't know if it's come over here, but this is like two weeks now, come on, two weeks I've had this. So, anyway, well, thank you everyone on Twitter for being here. I'm still trying to go alive on YouTube and it's not letting me.
said, let's have a look at what we've got. The Facebook page. Anyone who follows me, if you see me uploading stuff onto my Facebook page, then you know I'm going to do a live. Apart from on the weekends, because then on the weekends I don't normally go live. And if I've got my grandchildren, which I have this weekend. So. We're going to start with Right. And I'll tell you now, Chris, CP. Oh, God, don't they? CP has picked the wrong person. He thought she's a woman. He wasn't expecting, he obviously hadn't done any research on Nancy Christ. <laughs> because there's something we've noticed, he will not do interviews with men. Right? And I was just watching one from Thingy, Court TV. And we'll have a look at that one. And is is uh, he had... Um, the Pascal show host on and he said to me, he said, have you had CP and KP on your show? And he said, no, I'd love to have them on my show. So I left a comment dating, if you change your sex to female, you might get them on your show. <laughs> because he will not do it, they will not do interviews with me, they won't. And it's just so comical because it's, well, we know why. It's because he thinks he can uh, control women. Well, he got the wrong person when he thought about that with Nancy Grace because no one controls her. All right? So we're going to watch this. So shout out to Nancy Grace. Brilliant. If you're not following her on Twitter, she's on Twitter, I believe, yes. And, yes, yeah, she's on X. So follow her. She's, she's brilliant. She covers a lot of cases. Not just this case. She does a lot of cases. And, um, but this one is just got to her. I think this is, Ooh, she's got her teeth in this now because of CP. She's not letting this one go. So let's just get this ready. And we'll go ahead and watch. Towers, the bio dad and grandparents of missing autistic boy Sebastian Rogers hold a vigil where Everyone vows that Sebastian will be brought home. Will he? I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for with us here at Crime Stories as joining in the search for Sebastian. First of all, take a listen to this. Have the two of you taken a polygraph? I have. I have not. Would you be willing to? I've offered and volunteered on many occasions to take a polygraph, and I was told directly by law enforcement because of my whereabouts, I did not need one. I understand. Ms. Proudfoot, did you pass the polygraph? I did. That's not exactly what has been stated before by Sebastian Rogers stepfather Mr. Proudfoot listen and Mr. Proudfoot you have volunteered to take a poly yes ma'am 
If I were to set up a poly for you, would you take it? Name the place and time, ma'am. I'll be there. Joining me in All Star Panel to make sense of what we're hearing yeah. right now, but first to Dave Mack, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter. Dave Mack, isn't it true that CrimeOnline.com did set up a polygraph? Absolutely true. And what happened? He, uh, Chris Proudfoot, told us that he had to, he could not take it now. He wanted to, no. but he can't because the TBI told him not to. It's my understanding to Cheryl McCollum joining us. Uh, Cheryl McCollum, founder and director of the Cold Case Research Institute, forensics expert and host of Zone 7 podcast. Cheryl, it's my understanding that specifically Sebastian's stepfather said he could no longer do interviews, including with us, because he had been instructed so by the TBI and Jackie, correct me if I'm wrong, that they did not want any of his interviews to interfere with the investigation. And that even though he had agreed to do our polygraph, he now says that the TBI is going to polygraph. He can't take polygraph until after that. And once he does that, then, quote, we'll take it from there. What do you make of it? You know, you and I all, always go back to Mark class. If you want to make sure that the law enforcement has everything they need to get rid of look at you you can do that he can apply polygraph through attorney he can take your he can demand that tbi give him one so that they can stop focusing on him and this polygraph business and move on and find out where sebastian is at period i mean cheryl mccollum you and i can go right now and pay Pay for a polygraph. They'd be right. happy to take our money. Hey, just put it on a credit card and, and take a other. polygraph. TBI would be happy to accept those results. A polygraph, polygraph is a polygraph. And the examiner, that's who you're relying on. So you somebody's going to spy their reputation on the line. Again, he could make this happen today if he wanted to. Let's go straight. Call him out. Go on, Nancy. Call him out. Right? Because we've been calling him out on all these guys for weeks. And he knew after that first interview he had with you. He's not going to. He knew. Right? His whole demeanour during your, that interview was totally different to what we've seen on other interviews, right? He wasn't so controlling. He was letting talk and things like that. The only time they did do another interview after that because they went back up, well, she went back to her house. After this interview, after that interview, they did with Nancy. Guys, like she or what? She went back to the house, and they did another interview with someone. So she was on the computer at home, and he was on whatever in his trailer. And they kept talking to Katie, Chris. At the end of the day, Katie was the one who was there, Sebastian. Chris was not there, so he said. Right? So really, they don't want to be talking to Kate, uh, C, Chris. They want to be talking to Katie. The only time... So they kept asking other questions, and he's letting her answer these questions. Then all of he said about the shoes, and I'm not joking, he literally jumped in this conversation. 
and took it over. Something about the shoes really got to him. And he had to butt in them and take over. I'm thinking, why did you do that? Because he quite easily told us about the shoes. Why did he have to feel he had to butt in and add part of the shoes? But that's what he does when he's with our another woman. Woman, right? He's now started sitting back and letting Kate answer a lot more of the questions. But she's still looking at him for God, right? And now we don't know if they've worked out a little code between each other, like when they do it on different camps. They have some ladies at the this trailer. They don't have to work out a sort of code. Like, if you don't want me to answer a question, just do something and I'll, I'll jump in. You know what I mean? We don't know. I've not noticed anything. I'm going to have to try and find that interview if you can't. But it was a, about a day or so after the Nancy Grace interview. So. Let's out continue. to Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, professor of forensics, Jacksonville State University, author of Blood Beneath My Feet on Amazon and Star of a Hit series, Body Bags with Joe Scott Morgan. Joe Scott, thank you for being with us. You know what? This is like static in my ears because I know tick tock, tick tock. As long as we focus on the stepfather and the mother, Mr. and Mrs. Proudfoot, I'm losing time if by some stretch of the imagination, Sebastian is still alive. If he's alive, he won't be much longer. What do the stats show? What What is your opinion? I need it and I need it, Joe Scott. Yeah, the, the biggest thing that we're looking at is this idea of time. We're talking about a young man uh, that went missing back in February, Nancy, late February. And as we move down that timeline, uh, you know, the odds are, are stacked against him. I think one of the most important pieces that's kind of arisen out of this, other than all of the comments that have been made to this point relative to polygraphs and those sorts of things, is, are those eyeglasses. And I love the shot the producers put up of him standing in front of that rack of, of eyeglasses because that's going to tell the tale i think if they can specifically tie those to him that's very important they can take that script off of those glasses determine if they are his i don't think they're and, his glasses joe scott i don't well, think they're his glasses at this point in time you have to work with what you have if they're not his then that that points a different road doesn't it and so okay let's go with let's go with they're not his glasses. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that, Joe Scott. I yep. was thrilled. I mean, uh, you know, you might want to jump in on this, Cheryl. Remember, we're not having high tea at Wizard Castle. But it's a sad day when you're excited, when you're thrilled, you think, fine, I miss his glasses. Why is I miss it? was in the TV for us. So I see where you're going, Joe Scott. But it's a sad day when we're all thrilled to find a pair of beat up glasses on the side. But were they his glasses? And of course, with TBI, I'm just saying to the public, they're not his glasses. If you know what I mean. They're both telling us they're not, but really they are. It's like, okay, they're not his glasses. I'm not going to talk about them anymore. Take them off the table but really they are and they won't even tell the parents this because that's some if that's incredible information then when you think about it oh i'll try and pull it up no i can't there's um where those glasses were found was literally a stone a from Chris CP, that's Chris Proudfoot's mother and stepfather's house. 
too close for comfort. Right? They may not be his glasses, but I'm just saying perhaps they could be a law enforcement and TBI and put out there they're not. So that people won't be constantly throwing them up. They need to keep that close to their chest. They need that information. They don't need it out in the public eye. Side the road, but I was. So where does that leave me? Just got, as we're all like, take a poly, take a poly. Why won't they take a poly? What really happened? Was he at work? Was he not at work? Well, we're all gnashing our teeth and switching our tails trying to figure out about Mr. Proudfoot. If this kid, this child is out there with his autism kicking in giving him problems what's going to happen the likely scenario joe scott yeah if this is you know we're, we're talking about hendersonville tennessee uh nancy which is 10 miles outside of nashville but you know really quickly up there that area becomes very rural and so if he has wandered off or been taken off in any number of directions his ability or survivability is greatly diminished here. And what the police are doing right now is if you think about the last known location of him, that's the center of the target. And they're working from concentrically to eccentrically. They're moving out in these big circles. But it's such a broad, densely wooded area. This is a, this is a Herculean task, to say the least. I think that some of the answers are going to rest in the idea that whoever had control over him, some go over a kid has been diagnosed with autism, whoever had control over his things, their electronics need those, uh, those times when he was alive. And that's going to be one of the threads that you're going to want to pull in this investigation. Israel McCullough has some set is a forensic or as you know, Joe Scott. Cheryl, you've had quite a lot to say online. What about cat <laughs> talks like that? You're pretty no questioning you. But what about I want to hear your analysis? Here's the problem. They're statements. You've got inconsistencies. As soon as somebody changes their story at all to become the focus yeah period. exactly mom has said things now you've got dad it's like he's co-signing with everything that she, how can he agree with anything that she's saying you've exactly. got mom saying she heard a thud i don't like that word that sounds like a body hitting the floor when people use the word thud that's not sounded like he hit the wall sounded like something no wrong. it's never a good thing it's usually preceded no. by uh an adjective sickening a sickening thud right and nancy you've got other things you've got mom saying he went to the end of the driveway to put out the trash and then you've got law enforcement searching a landfill they're searching lakes they're searching ponds if you're watching and paying attention to law enforcement it does not seem to me that they are looking to recover a child alive. They are searching for remains. You and I both know, and Joe Scott knows, when a child goes missing, the first, the first three hours are critical. We're at six weeks. Six weeks that this child has not been seen or heard from. Okay, six hold on. Why are you saying, Cheryl McCollum, that you believe they don't expect to find such an alive based on their actions. I'm talking about LA law enforcement. They're searches. They're searching landfills, lakes, yeah. ponds. That is not indicative of somebody that is alive. And again, you've got a child that has gone six weeks without his medicine, six weeks without food that we know of. He didn't have a source, no shoes. And mama herself says, oh, a flashlight's missing. Again, that's such an odd for her to know is missing until they show her video that looks like a flashlight. And then the stepdad says, well, we were sure hoping it was, but we're sad to report it wasn't a flashlight. Well, if you've got two flashlights out there, why are you glad that it's not that? 
that to me would signify that somebody was out there in the wee hours of the morning with two flashlights, meaning two separate people, the night your child went missing. I mean, it's just odd. What they do you make they- of a three-hour conversation held between yeah. Mrs. Proudfoot and Mr. Proudfoot? Now, come on. Come on. It's like me. God bless you, Tom. My, the, father to my, the, the father to my kids no longer live with God bless you. However, when he went to work, it's like, yes, I can now finally clean my home. Because when he had days off, it doesn't matter what I did, cleaning, sweeping, cleaning the floors, plumping the cushions up, you know what I mean? Polishing, you name it. My house never looked clean. Never. Right? And it was like, so when he went to work, it's like, yes, I can now finally clean my home and have it clean. I literally, my kids would be at school from 9 a.m. in the morning till 3.30. Yeah. So I'd get them about quarter past nine. So from quarter past nine till quarter past ten, quarter past ten, till about lunchtime, I'd have bathroom, kitchen, living room, my stairs, and my bedroom and their bedroom, all done. I'd have washing put on, washing on out. You know what I mean? I'd have it all done by lunchtime. And then I could just sit there and just chill out in a nice, clean house. No, everything could do for two, three hours. Right? No way would I be talking to my husband for three hours. Once he left to go to work, I wouldn't be. Sorry, it's not happening. Right? I gave up even trying to phone my husband up. Right? Because a couple of times I've tried phoning him. Right? Or leaving him a message. Right? Because I thought I'd leave him a message because I know he's at work. He won't see, he won't get his phone till he has a break. He never even got back to me when he read the messages. And I could see he read the message. Right? So in the end, I thought, you know what? Stuff it. I'm not even going to message him. So if he ever tried to phone me, I'd go, yep, well, I'll put my phone straight back down. No, you can talk to me when you get home now. All right? You've got from 6 p.m. till when we go to bed. For you to talk to me then. I don't need to be talking to you when there's no emergency. If there's an emergency, then Vince wouldn't be Vince wouldn't be phoning me. It would be his work. Right? His works would be phoning me. So I knew it wasn't an emergency if ever if, if he ever phoned me, which was very unlikely. He never, he never replied to any of my texts when I first used to text him. So he's not going to phone me. And I'm not going to phone him. And you definitely won't be on the phone for three hours. Christ's sake, no way. The night Sebastian disappears. The three-hour phone call bothers me. Because again, that's a long time to be on the phone. And, you know, you're hearing your son supposedly, he's answering you supposedly during that time, but you don't go check on him at all. You know, did somebody leave their phone just on while they went and did something else? I don't know. But I agree with Joe Scott. The electronics are going to tell the story. When his mama first entertained the idea that somebody had him, what did she base that on? His phone's not missing. He didn't take shoes, didn't take clothes, didn't take money. Nothing on his cell phone, nothing on his computer says that he's been talking to anybody. I mean, she's entertaining something that 
we have no facts for. Well, we I'm have concerned no about, the, uh, and, and you're right, whenever I hear inconsistent statements, as I've discussed many, many times in front of juries, it's one thing to add or embellish your around. Maybe you remembered something in addition, triggered by questions. But when you change your story, that's a problem. To just got Morgan joining us, uh, Professor Jacksonville, Jacksonville State University. Um, Joe Scott, let's look at where the searches are being conducted. Yeah. We know the law enforcement search has been scaled back. I want to hear, since you are a death investigator, we all three have been on many, many searches for missing people and who we believe to be dead. Um, I want to hear your analysis. What can we glean from looking at what law enforcement is doing? Back to Cheryl's point about landfills and ponds. Ponds you, or water, water, bodies of water. You can think that, well, you have people that can um, just wander into these locations, okay? Particularly somebody that might be in a compromised state like this young man. Uh, from a mental and a physical uh, status at this point in time. But when you start to talk about landfills, Nancy, this is a rather dark, dark thing. I've been to landfills multiple times conducting death investigations. And those are locations where we're talking about the discarding of remains. Now, here's another interesting point. The fact that the landfill is all the way up. You mean he didn't just walk into a landfill and fall over? No and certainly not in Kentucky. This is specifically targeted. Now, from my understanding is that landfill is used to surf it or serve this particular area. And landfills are very complex environments. They're gridded off, essentially. They know where they're going to do dumpings. Um, it's not like they randomly go into these locations and just back the truck up. They go to specific locations. Can I just... They were in Kentucky is the landfill they use for the, uh, that construction dogs use with their big skips, right? For rubble and metal and whatever they have on their construction sites, right? that is put in these skips those skips are the ones that are took to the kentucky landfill right and now if you listen to that phone uh dispatch call you heard one one of the law enforcement officers say call to another say can you put your drone over the top of this over the top of the, this bin meaning the skip right to see if they could see anything in there from the drone and that's the only that's why the way to kentucky because that's where the skips they have my knowledge i have not heard and neither anyone else on youtube heard of any law enforcement doing a search at where the general waste, household waste, is taken to. We have not heard anything about that. And I hope to God they have done a search there because if it's correct in what they're saying that the garbage men said their bins felt that bit heavier than normal, and the fact that Sebastian used to ask it, say to his people at school, put me in the bin, put me in the bin, as a joke, right? He wanted them to put me in the bin. Now we put out on YouTube that they believe they used to, his mother and his stepfather used to put him in their bin as a punishment, right? Perhaps one of the punishments was that night, he, they put him as a punishment. He came down with a phone call 
or reading a book, forgot about it, go up, put the dog in the kennel, the cage, and went to bed. And just been men have come along. Now they've just been made, just been sort of going at the bottom of the dry. All I've got to do is pull them round, then hook them onto the big mechanical arm. Which then tips it all into the back. Right, so I hope to God they have been in check the urban landfill where the domestic household waste is took. But with landfills, they're highly complex, they're layered. And so you, as you begin to stack items in there, they then run over them with this heavy equipment. And it makes, it makes the, the going very, very tough. As a matter of fact, anything that gets in there begins to degrade and decompose very quickly. That's the purpose of it. And so that is not a good sign, Nancy. And the fact that they are searching a landfill is rather ominous to me. Nancy, I want to, to Dave Matt, quick, Crime Online. Before we go any further, I'd just like to say hello to all those on YouTube. Sorry you missed the beginning. It was not my fault. It was YouTube. There are some technical issues with putting out any lies. So I'm really sorry about that. Uh, we, as you can tell, we are going through the Nancy Grace interview about Sebastian Rogers and her thoughts. That lot. So thank you for being here. Dropping a silo. Uh, no, I was just coming to you because I wanted to talk oh, to sorry. you, Dave Mack, on two issues and whatever else you want to interject. Please, I need everybody's thoughts. Um, one, I want to get from you any previous inconsistent statements as correctly stated by Cheryl McCollum. And two, allegations that Sebastian, this autistic boy, was molested have emerged. Let's start with the inconsistent statements very quickly. From the very beginning, Nancy, uh, Chris Proudfoot made statements and in interviews online uh, claiming he actually... I would say it's not allegation that he was SI. Because if it was an allegation by Steph, Rogers, the father, then the mother would will, will put out a totally different um, reply. But she didn't. She said, I just felt the mother was supporting that lad who had abused her son because she said he was not. 13. I don't care how old he was. Her coming out and saying that, she wasn't denying it happened. So it isn't an allegation. That is true. That somebody asked the question, was a polygraph taken and has it been passed? Yes. I didn't specify who or when, but what I can tell you, everything has been vetted completely. Polygraphs have come back as passed. So I'm confused as in why they are all wondering if myself, my wife, and the biological father took. Okay, we know that's a lie. We know that is absolutely a lie because of what he told you on your show. But you're saying that that's what Proudfoot said, that he had taken a polygraph, he and his word wife, and had been, quote, vetted. Okay. Yes. yes. He, he did has... say that on, on, a, on a podcast. Go ahead. Okay, and then we have the, the belt. You know, we have hitting hitting Sebastian with the belt. I don't know if you caught this, but, you know, when Seth Rogers was on your show last week when we were got, talking about the, the belt, he started crying. Um, I saw later Seth referred to it as he wasn't aware of the corporal punishment that Chris Proudfoot was handing out to his son, to Seth Rogers' autistic son. And, you know, we uh, Proudfoot he claimed it was years ago and it was one spank with the belt on his butt, but through clothing, which makes no sense to any parent in the history of mankind or any teacher at school that they would actually look into something. They couldn't remember when, how long ago, 
it was. And then in another interview, he said 15, which means it had to have been in the last several months. Correct. And it went missing February 26th. Right. Um, right, I'm back. So uh, I lost it on the screen, and I'm thinking, what's happening here? Normally, flick something off, and that's, the inter- that's just the internet playing up. But it took a bit longer for it to come back on. So if he was 15 when he got um, um, a whack with a belt, that would have been in the last few months just before he disappears. So which one is true? Was it three years ago or was it when he was 15 years old? Um, another question. Allegation. They're both true. Because if you remember, uh, if you remember when the uh, woman from Child Services come out, about the belt incidents where the school hold on that belt incident when he was 15 she knew him they'd met previously maybe a year two years before but they'd met before so there'd been another incident beforehand so this was second incident that she had been called out to that that Sebastian was molested have now emerged what can you tell us from Seth Rogers Sebastian's biological father, Seth Rogers, said that when the Proudfoots, when uh, Katie, a couple of years, several years ago, that Katie Proudfoot allowed a uh, boy that was five years older than the boy was 13, Sebastian was eight at this time. She allowed, and Seth Rogers said that Chris, uh, Katie Proudfoot allowed a 13 year old boy to play with Sebastian, who was eight without any kind of involvement from Katie Proudfoot and that during the time this 13 year old molested and raped Sebastian Rogers. It seems the more we investigate uh, every day Sebastian Rogers is well, sir, yeah, all try to phone this autistic and to you, Mr. Proudfoot. I along the for photograph free of charge to you. I'll pay for it out of my pocket. We wait as the search goes on. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for. Right. So, did you hear that, CP? Right. The offer is still on the table. Will he take this offer? I could put a million pounds down if I had it. Yes, and I'll win that bet because he's not going to take the polygraph. And we won't even know if he makes one with the law enforcement or or TBR because they won't tell us if he took one because they don't have to tell us. So we can tell them and say, yes, I've took my lie detector. Yes, I passed. We won't know if he took one. I don't know if he's passed. So if he comes out in the next day or so, say, to my polygraph, I say, show us proof. Show us proof that you took a polygraph because I will not believe a word that comes out of his mouth. 
right? And there are others. So, when she took one with Nancy Grace, which she had set up for him, then we'll know if he took it or not. Right? Now, people are saying about Seth who's supposed to be taking his polygraph today. Right? About the medication he's on. Now, there's some medication that you can take which wouldn't interfere with the with a polygraph so I'm hearing. Right? So, it all depends. I'm sure he would come back to us the other night and said, look, I can't, I'll let, you know, I can't take that polygraph at the moment because I'm on this medication. But he hasn't come back to us about that. So I'm sure he will take that polygraph because Seth has nothing to hide. As he says, you only go looking if you've lost something. If you're not looking, then you've not lost anything. Right? He's looking. Seth is looking because he has lost his son. Now, like I said last night, okay, there might be reasons why they can't go out and search. The law enforcement don't particularly like parents to be out there searching because if they find their son, being alive or alive. If he's alive, that child is evidence. And, do, and for a parent not to just go up and grab that child and hold him would be very hard to not do. And if that parent came across the child and alive, it'd be hard for him not to go up and just hold him again. I hold him in his arms or something, you know what I mean? Because that body would then be evidence. So, I can understand the police not wanting family members out there searching, but there's nothing stopping her from going up to where the meeting points were and saying, Thank you to all these people out there searching, or even going around and putting leaf uh, flyers out. Now, I was saying last night about how people are keep following CP and KP around, and one woman said this was on Monday that she. And the cars were still there. Now, bear in mind, CP was supposed to be working. This was on the Monday. Late morning, mid-afternoon. And his car was there. And she said, don't we think someone should do a welfare check? Right? Now, they could be hunkered down in that trailer. You know what? I don't think they're there. I think his stepfather or his mother has come and collected them, collected them, and they've gone either back to their house or somewhere else. Right? I think they've left their cars there and the trailer there to people believe they are there. So unless they've got people watching them, we don't know if law enforcement have hired, I took a trailer out there and plonked it there to, to keep an eye on them. We don't know. So I don't think they are there. I think they have been moved out during the night, but left their car and the trailer and get make out that they are there but I don't think they are I really don't and I think if it's house, then they could be using her car or one of their cars 
So, but the more you, people go after them, the less time is being spent on Sebastian. Now, last night, um, hold on, I'll pull it up. I don't know what it means. By all this, because um, uh, And it says, hi everyone, I was informed, informed by the search team, Seth and Brandon team. For the time being, they will not be, be having new searches to come help for safety reasons and will no longer have information on when and where to meet at to search. From that, I gave up. Yes, they've still got their searches there, but they're not asking any or letting any new ones come on. Right? Uh, it did say that was soldiers to have uh, their meetup point because they didn't want to overstay their well. Even though the Rugers have said they can use their car park until Sebastian is found. They don't want to be over use their welcome. You know what I mean? But just that they so why has Seth been informed about something? She can't because I'm on second day one. So we'll not stop looking for that work, right? But I can guarantee you on your days off, yeah, looking for his soul, right? So I can't see him not searching unless something which has been told about. So back to that. All right, let's have a look. The other one I want to look at today. Uh, we've seen Nancy Gray. CP, the offer is still open. Will he? No. Hi, uh, Peter Hyatt. Who called police to report Sergeant Rogers missing? This is a really good uh, discussion. Right, you really need to go and watch this. I might just clip onto it near the end, but I won't go through it all because it is very interesting. I believe Court TV. Right. See Paul you see? Yeah, it's bothering you. Well, I'm into because I thought the album was normal. Play back the normal. Okay. Share this tab. 
this is an interesting one to watch as well. But like I said, if people know, if you follow me on Facebook and you see me uploading or sharing stuff on Facebook, then you've got a good idea of what I'm going to be talking about on my live. Because everything I get, I watch, I share onto my Facebook. So that not only I see, but others see as well. Hi there, Tracy. Like, not so that it's just for me or for my everyone else. It's just to get the word out there. But it also helps me know where everything is when I go come to do a live. That way I'm not searching for YouTube for this and YouTube for that. It's all, all on my Facebook page. It's either on my Facebook page or my X account. So, I don't know what, listen to this. I have speeded it up just a little bit. Not that much. Uh, you see, there is an unsolved mystery. It was a Sunday night going into a Monday morning and 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers was supposed to be inside his home sleeping. His mother, Katie Proudfoot, says he went to bed at 9, but was making some noise around sleep. Around she was in his room to get him ready for school. But Sebastian was gone. He searched the house and he was nowhere to be found. Sebastian's stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, was not home. And Sebastian's father, Seth Rogers, was at work about 45 minutes away. Police responded and began trying to figure out what happened. That was back on February 26th. And now, more than a month later, no sign of Sebastian, no sign of foul play, and no answers about what happened. Tonight, we'll take a look at some of the strange facts surrounding this case, like the lights in the neighborhood at 3 a.m. We'll also take a closer look at Sebastian and how his medical conditions and mental health could have played a role. And we'll focus on the water search as we continue our investigation into the mysterious disappearance of Sebastian Rogers. I'm Betty Politan. Thank you for joining us tonight in Closing Arguments. I, I can't tonight. In yeah, it is a mystery. In the search for a 15 year old boy with autism. And you take a step back and, and you think, well, what are, what are the possibilities of where he is or what happened to and run away? But could have 15 old boy in the middle of the away not evidence of anything could he be that still people always run away they don't be found for whatever reason and obviously that's a possibility here but if your boy played off Sorry about this, I've just got picked up. 
No, I agree. I agree. It, it, is, it is a mystery, and things they are saying don't add up. But I'm just going to try and get that back again. Come on. So, I can't. I, well, I I know, love. Yeah, you can give one interview, but during that interview, something might be said that could trigger you, and then you go, "Oh yes, I remember. This happened. Do you know where I am coming from? Right, but." I just planned like the first interview. Well, first one was a live, live with a YouTuber. Right. Uh, the second one was with a, a TV news channel. And he kept referring to Katie as the mum. It's a bit weird to me. And, but then in the following interviews, he started calling her by her name, Katie. Because everyone, after that first initial news one, news release interview, I'd noticed how he, he kept calling her Kate, her mum, and how that was weird. Now, I can understand father or stepfather going, come to my child, where's your mum? Ask your mum. Go and get your mum for me. Right? To a child. When the child is not in that room, you won't say that. You won't go, you won't call mum, would you? You go, Katie or whatever your partner's name is. You call them by their name when you're not, when the child is in that room. You call them by their name. So that was just very weird to a lot of us. But we noticed then after that interview, because he picked up on what we were saying, that he started to call her Katie. And the fact that they never used his name in that interview, they then started using his name. And then when she said she heard something, at 10 o'clock, because everyone will go, why didn't you check on your son? He's got uh, autism, he's got disability. Other problems as well, health problems. Surely you just pop your head in and just see if it's okay when you go to, go to bed. That's when she came out with this. Well, I heard him, I heard him always in his bedroom. And I told him, I shouted to him, saying, whatever you're doing, you better pack it in and go to sleep. So then people were going, why didn't you check on him? Why didn't you go and check on him? That was my child. I'd have been right in there. What are you doing? Why aren't you in bed? Why aren't you asleep? You know what I mean? So then, in the next interview, she comes out with, yeah, at 10 o'clock, I heard a thud. Right? And I'll just shout it to him, whatever you're doing, you better pack it in. Right? And then people go, hold oh, on, you heard your thought, but you didn't go and check on it. Right? Then the next interview, she comes out with, well, I heard your thought, so I shouted to her, Bubba, was that you falling out of bed? He replied, no, ma'am. So she made out she had this conversation with him at 10 o'clock. I thought, give me a fucking break. This woman is watching every YouTube. She's watching every, reading every comment people are putting on Facebook pages, right? And she's adding what we're saying on these Facebook pages and on our YouTube lives. She's then adding into her narrative. 
and then I'm just gonna slap her. If, if she'd been sitting in front of me, I slapped her. Slapped her real. Because to me, that's when someone is lying. I can understand when you're doing an interview, you don't always remember everything. And by talking about something, you might like, oh, I don't. Before, before I went to bed, I did hear him at 10 o'clock. And I did shout through to him. You know what I mean? Did she get him? You know what, Joy? Joy, I, I've heard that. But I don't know. I don't know if, it, if it's a, if it, you know, a criminal investigation. I don't know. Something about Channel 5, which is Fox News or whatever, said it. And I've been looking and I haven't found anything. So, it should have been a criminal investigation from day one. Christ's sake. And anyway, we're going to carry on watching this. And while this is ringing, I'm just going to make myself a coffee. The evidence. I mean, there's no evidence of foul play. That doesn't mean that there wasn't foul play and they just have found any evidence. Or it could be a combination of the two that he decides to leave on his own and then something else. There's no forensic evidence of anything happening anywhere. Like, this is baffling to me. 24. In 2024, someone just vanished. You know, where, where could he be? I think these water searches are, are crucial. And we're going to talk about that today. And you look at the neighborhood and you, you go, and there's pond and a murky. Like, wouldn't there be evidence leading to that pond or something, wherever it is, whether it's close? Or, and how far is he getting without shooting in the middle of the night? Like, really, where's he going? Where's a 15-year-old without shoes going? Why doesn't anyone know? Why doesn't anyone know? I'm asking a lot of questions tonight because there's a question. There seemingly aren't answers anywhere. Why does anyone know? We is. It's mind boggling. At this case, in most of the cases that we covered, someone's missing. There, there are certain clues. Oh, there's a ping off of a cell. Someone who. Who's, who's wanted, there is something that is left behind that, okay, the case isn't solved, but there's a lead, like there's a direction. Here, there's nothing. Absolutely. How is that possible? Internet is bad tonight. our guest joining us tonight. Podcaster, Pascal. Yay. Uh, Pascal. Nothing. Nothing, Pascal. Uh, but I got to be honest. <laughs> this is getting thicker than a snicker. <laughs> still any answers to all the questions and even more and more. Questions keep coming uh, up and answers back. And I don't know what's going on. It's so crazy. Okay. And uh, we're, we're turning loose all over the place. Uh, anything, yet, did something happen that would make him want to leave? Was there a reason for him to go somewhere? Is there evidence of him going anywhere? How do you know? 
of the house. Um, what a question just by looking at map. So we have. Hold on before we go, carry on. How did you get out? And we want to tell me this because apparently, and the other door they use, you need a key to lock it on the outside. It doesn't lock it automatically, it locks with a key. Right? That key is not missing, that key is still there. So that means it didn't go out that door. Right? Could you have gone out the front door with the passcode? door locks automatically because you need the passcode to get back in right and um but who seriously believes one did you return home that night from the skatehouse Two, was there an altercation in the house and something happened in that bedroom? Or three, was he put in the garage? Right? I told as a punishment. Yeah? Because don't forget they had that bed or mattress in that garage. So, as a punishment, or for you say two, which is what now? <laughs> I can't even remember what two was now. One was, did you come home? Two, you think there's an altercation? Two and three, two, two and three. Right, okay, one was an altercation and one was where he's put in the garage. Or, or in the bit, right? I think sure I'm stuck between one and two and three. Right, I'm sitting on the fence, literally. Right? Because there's no proof to say he come home. We've only got her word that he took that rubbish out that night. But even on the camera from the door bow camera across the room it's not very clear Seth said oh you I'm sorry am I breaking up I think it's my internet my internet is playing up we've got some bad weather here in Scotland right I'll try and talk a bit slower so it's going a bit better right there's no, as we said, we've only got her word, and Seth said he's seen the ring doorbell of him, whoever bringing the trash bin down. But we couldn't see who it was because they got a torch, a little light torch, but it wasn't giving off a light. A light. Right, so it didn't actually show him who it was. Right, so that could have been anyone. Right, and then you got the altercation in the bedroom where perhaps she's heard him doing something in the bedroom, she's gone in, had words with him, got out of control, probably pushed him, whatever, he's foul and hit his head. Now, don't forget, he's got that fluid on the brain where if he hits that part of his head, it will kill him. He's probably then got up and got into bed. Right? And, and died during, it, during the night. Because remember what she said in that very first interview. I went into his room I woke him up and he was gone. Why would you wake someone up if they wasn't in their bed?
So as for putting him in the garage, that could have happened as well. Perhaps he was messing up his bedroom and don't forget she was on that three hour phone call to Chris and he's gone, right, if he's trashed his bedroom, put him in the garage. Put him in the garage. Slip if you sleep in there. You called that too, did you? Yes. I went and woke him up and he was gone. Now, that says a lot. That says a hell of a lot. So I think perhaps there was an altercation in the bedroom. He's hit his head, got into bed then, and gone to sleep and died. She's then panicked, right? She then, instead of phoning the police straight away, who does she phone? Her husband. She's telling him then what happened. Right? And he's gone, right. Because apparently, she said she got in the car and drove around. He said he phoned the police at 20 past six. Well, we know the call didn't come through till 6.39 a.m. So, there's a 19 minute difference from when he said the phone and when they received the call. While on the call to the police, I've just heard this today, that he told Katie to go put her phone on mute. Why? Was she not in the car driving around? Or was she in the car? Had she by then put Chris, uh, Sebastian in the back of her car, gone driving around, and someone, I was trying to find this, um, this piece of information to get on the Facebook page, and I couldn't find it. So it's a few days old, so you, you imagine you go through all the posts that have been put on these Facebook pages. It, unbelievable amount you put on in a day. Anyway, this woman said she saw a black or blue was it Chevrolet or something like that, which she believed was the mother, CP's mother, car, parked up somewhere on that main road. Did Katie drive up to there? Right? Do the exchange Sebastian and then come back to the house? Just a thought to think about. Let's continue some idea of where all this is happening. It's a neighborhood, it's a nice neighborhood. There is a construction of another nice neighborhood taking place next door. Um, you look on this map, there's a cemetery. There's uh, various places where there are small bodies of water. There is a high school there as well. There's Long Hollow Pike, the road. On the other side of that road, there is um, a whole bunch of, of trees and brush and more bodies of water there. But at the end of the day, Pascal, when, when we begin here, um, looking at this neighborhood, that, that's the first thing. I always start with the neighborhood. And this is not, not the middle of nowhere. There's, there's uh, nice homes, like really nice homes in this neighborhood. If you're leaving, and if someone is coming to meet him in the middle of the night, I would think someone would have seen or heard or some video somewhere would show us something. Right. I mean, you'd think that one of the, at least some sort of room camera would have picked something up, some security camera, something of some sort would have shown Sebastian around. I mean, of course, we've seen this flashlight video. It looks like fireflies in the dark. Now that's been debunked, saying that that is a, a, a garbage truck, which I'm still wondering how a garbage truck 
with a light on moves around in that kind of fashion. It just seems a little bit weird to me. At but 3 o'clock in the morning. Let me tell you, exactly. the garbage man shows up in my neighborhood at 3 o'clock in the morning. Everyone in the neighborhood's calling the next day saying, don't ever do that. Well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> I could not sleep. Right? I gave up in the end. So I was up at 3 a.m. this morning. I was so tempted to come and do a live. Not doing it. So I sat and watched some YouTube. Other YouTubers, right? I went back to bed at 6 a.m. What started at 7 a.m. outside? Put someone hammering and banging. I felt like going down. 14 flights and grabbing whatever it was I was using and lamping it over their flipping heads. I thought, I've just come out of bed. I've had like a little sleep and you're doing this. And this went on till lunchtime today. Now, I've just been men come about, I'd say about 8ish, 9ish. In the morning. This is not three o'clock in the morning. Seth has told us. The camera that this was being picked upon is not from their street. Not on their street. It was from another road. That was really high, I thought. The way it was angled down. Sort of thing really high and i'm thinking where would they get something high like that from right where would they come get such an angle and a height like that it wasn't in their road it was from another house off another road and it wasn't at 10 past three in the morning it was six o'clock ten past six right Apparently, the guy who videoed it, who had this home recording, his home recorder had stuck, the clock had stuck on three o'clock. So I think it was recording, it was recording at 3 a.m. Right? So it was stuck. So this was at about 6 a.m. ish. Oh God. Right, let me just make sure now. Don't worry about this no more. This video, no, I'm not bothered about it no more. I do believe Seth. Right? I do believe Seth when he says it is a garbage man. If Katie and Chris had told me it was garbage, man, I'd be going, get the hell out of here. Right? But, you know, Seth said it was, he's seen the whole video. And he said, that clip we're seeing is literally like the top right-hand corner of the screen. It doesn't show you the whole screen. that again because it's gonna wake everybody <laughs> yeah no doubt absolutely so that's the thing that doesn't make any sense what's the activity that was going on in that area and is there any depiction of that at all let's do this there's an audio recording that's been circulating online that sounds like it could be a radio transmission call from a canine handler during the search for sebastian the speaker references several places near Sebastian's home, like that construction site we've been talking about, the cemetery and the retention pond. The link to the audio file was uploaded to Twitter by SF Investigates. It's unclear, though, where the recording came from originally. Let's take a listen. Nice to meet you, Matt. Going into the construction pond here, back toward the beach. Going behind you. I'm going to go money. Do you see me? Don't try anything. You shouldn't have any shoes on. Hey, this is all dry. I'll Outside report. I'll tell you, we're now heading back south towards the cemetery on the far end of the construction site. Hey, boy. I do have some footprints over here. 
Right there where you're standing? Yeah. Lean right over here to the retaining pond. No shooters, just rope rats. And that we believe is the gay nine, Pascal. And, and we, we heard about this early on in the investigation, which would, you know, make some sense. There's a scent that they're following towards the retention pond. Uh, but my understanding is they drained the retention pond and found nothing here. Yeah, that's what I've learned as well. I mean, I remember in the very beginning of this whole case, they were saying that no scent. There was no scent at all. all. Now. Now we're suddenly hearing about footprints and a scent leading into this. Even drained the pond. So what's going on here? What's the truth? Who's misleading who? And why are they holding, withholding this information? Because I don't know which, which is the truth. And I think the public really wants to know. We, I think, deserve to know the people that are out here volunteering time after time, day after day, looking for Sebastian. They deserve to know something that pertains to getting closer to finding Sebastian. Now, you've spoken with uh, Sebastian. I'm sorry. We don't deserve to know. We don't. We are just Joe Bloggs, the public, will not think. The police do not have to tell us anything. They tell us big things, drop them, just to keep us quiet. But we don't, they don't have to tell us that. Right? And but I will say one thing when the police stop telling us any information, that's when we get all these stupid hypotheses and conclusions being thrown out there. Like when I first seen that video of the lights, right? I questioned that light on the left hand corner of that video. Um, but then when I was listening to others, I got so so like so trapped by what everyone else is saying. Um, okay, it's like two people with torches, and then they say, No, it isn't two people with torches. And I said, Oh no, forgot it was aliens. You know what I mean? Stupid things like that. I can't, people were coming out with stupid conclusions. I now believe it was a a garbage truck. I really do. Right? Seth is not telling us everything he, he was. But he's been to by the police. He's been told he works for the police himself. So we know what can be said. There. But this thing about the dog that did throw me because I want to know how you get a false positive how a dog can take you to a certain place but then there's no body there or there it's called a false positive no it means nothing to me it means because there's no more track, no more footprints, no more scent, the child or whatever could have been picked up and carried to the car. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. And I don't know, upon another saint, which wasn't Sebastian. But I truly believe only one dog. CP said in that phone call we had with knocked drop uh, divers the other day. Three dogs hit on the same place. Three dogs. You no, know, we've got knowledge of one dog. Dog. So, and not only that, why would they tell Chris this information? They told Seth about that one dog, but why would they tell Chris three dogs? But only South Tower.
Seth, who's the father, only one dog. Why is he being told all this information by law enforcement? But Seth isn't. Are they feeding him information that is not true to see if he runs with it? Right? And if that is the case, then it's working because he's running with that information they've told him. He's running. So, it's only one dog I heard, not really like he's saying, one dog. His father on your show several times. Um, let's take a listen to one of those uh, interviews and discussions that you had involving this dog following a one dog followed a scent out into a construction site and then it disappeared. Could you maybe expand on that or explain a little bit more about that? Well, the dog handlers told me first day. Wow. That the dog and all the way around and I trusted it engine. It's like it was nothing. Uh, normally the same and stop on would be that guy. That's true. So now you listen to that. And again, they're saying that there's no evidence of foul. But how do we know that scent that dog picked up of, of Sebastian that guy? How do we know in Maybe on a Saturday, the mother put him out as a punishment. Hung off walking, have a nosy around the area. Gone up to the construction site where the big diggers are to have a look up there. You know what I mean? He could, if she's put him out as a punishment, he could have gone off on a little walk by himself on the Saturday. And that could be the scent they picked up on from the Saturday. I'll play, but there's a scent leading to nothing, to absolutely nothing uh, there, Pascal. I mean, you've got to deduce something from that. They haven't really talked about this a lot, but this would seem to be a potential lead your explanation Sorry, as to what is playing up. could have ha happened here if, in fact, he's leaving the house, heading to that towards that. Footprints going in or a foot ascent going into this construction site uh, talks about the pond. But then he came on later in another show, days later, about a week later, said, well, that they are talking what the bond profits about this scent leading into the pond. Yet again, like Vinny, that was dream walks that pond. So are we still talking about this print scent areas? Like I said, something's just for me. And and we're not have the proud come on your show? No, I would love to have him on my. It's a difficult spot for everyone. That's where I left a comment saying, "If you change your sex to a female, because all the YouTubers have noticed they're going up on a show when it involves a male, because Chris can't control men." It becomes very confrontational. I remember once he was on live. Who was he on a live with? I can't remember. Riley. Right? Smiley. Smiley's will. Really good. That's another one. If you're not a member to, go and join her. Right? I'll put a link in the description. Anyway. So... 
his had been signed something beforehand. So, uh, Josh, so whatever, put in a lap, another good YouTuber, excellent YouTuber, in fact. I'll put his link in the Please go subscribe to him. Right? Smiley. And asked to come up. So she brought Josh up on the panel. And while she brought Josh, Chris had gone off. Right? He was having problems. And he kept losing connection. Anyway, he comes back on. And Smiley goes, just to let you know, Josh from the lab is joining us and his whole demeanor changed. He became confrontational with Josh. As soon as Josh said, well, okay, fine, whatever, and left the panel, his demeanor changed again. He does not like me. He will not become very confrontational when it comes to everyone involved and, and they they've spoken to the chronicles of olivia we spoke with her uh they've spoken with uh, nancy grace as well obviously they don't see things to begin with But at this point, uh, you hear a lot, you hear very little from the Proudfoots. Seth seems to still be on the ground there, involved in coordinating some searches near on the structure site, close uh, and the Prouds seem out of town. Yeah, they're gone. It seems like, honestly, they um, are the position of Tommy. Optically, it looks really, really bad. I wish that they were here or there doing whatever they can to find Sebastian because, again, it should be the three of them. Boots on the ground trying to find Sebastian. But this also gives us a little bit, it shines a little bit of a light, the, the relationship dynamic that are going on between the three of them. Something wow. seems like a... He's got here. CP, my guy can you everything was all rosy and lovely between all three of them and as soon as he said that he got my little brain cells twitching no way no way sorry you were seeing her before she actually got the divorce come through you was also married to your to Nina seeing Katie. Katie was still married to Seth and you were still married to Nina. Seth said that Chris had been in Sebastian's time before they got the divorce. So uh, something might be a little bit off between the three of them. Oh, I agree. I agree. And and later on in the program, we're going to dig through um, some of the divorce documents. And you can uh, by reading those, you understand people get divorced for a reason. Things are bad. But, you know, we had an experience, and maybe it was very unusual with Gabby Petito. Her parents both got remarried, and together that group was a force, and they were all on the same page. Looking Absolutely. for Gabby desperately. That's not the case here, and it could have to do with the dynamics of the divorce, everything else. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, it, it, there's not a unified approach to the search, to looking, to trying to find what happened here, and that that is troubling. Well, from from people you've spoken to in, in all of this, do you get a sense that the Proudfoots were were getting some flack, and, and it could have been potentially dangerous for them to have? Well, Riley Stern. His mother and father were separated and in new relationships, was they not? And they stood together as one. 
right? <laughs> if I met a guy and I found out he'd been married four times, I'd be going, red flag, red flag. I'd literally be making my excuses to get out of that date. I really would. So that was a big red flag there. So but I'm going back to that comment you made, Tracy, because it was announced earlier. Um, who was it announced it earlier? Joey. Jo Joey. Joy Hartley. She said they have announced that it is now a criminal investigation, and you just said the same. Where did you hear that from? Because I've tried finding that and I can't find it anywhere. So, if you can let me know, I'll try and find it. Hang around. That people were looking at them the wrong way. And we know sometimes how these stories and cases can take on a life of their own. And you start to feel a little bit of the pressure. Well, I will say this. I mean, I get it that they may be getting death threats. They may be getting some threats of some sort. There may be a lot of pressure where everybody's giving them the hard side eye. I definitely get that. But at the end of the day, the main common goal should be universal. The focus on finding Sebastian. I don't know about you, okay, but as a family man, as someone who cares for my loved ones, if ever someone I loved went missing, I don't care how much ridicule if I became the the town's pariah, I wouldn't care. I'd still show up and do everything I could to find my son, to find my daughter, to find my loved one. So optically, again, this is very, very weird. It, it, it's it's counter to what people... Is it this one that you're seeing, um, should I say, because is it this one then? Because I haven't watched all of this. Because I come across it literally about 15 minutes or so before I was due to come live. So I'm only seeing a little bit of it. I didn't see it all. And I thought, oh, I need to watch that later. And I thought, I'll watch it on here with you lot. But it should have been a criminal investigation from day one. There was too many red flags. Too many. One. Right? First one. She heard a thud at 10 o'clock the night before. She didn't check on it. Red flag. Two. I went to wake him up. He was gone. Red flag. Three. He left between 12 p.m. when she went to bed. And when she went to wake him up at 6 a.m. Now, how did she know? He left at between 12 and 6. He could have left between 10 p.m. the night before. You know what I mean? Or 10.30 the night before. Because the last time she heard him was at 10 o'clock. So he could have gone any time after 10 o'clock. Right? Five or four, whichever one you want now. He left without no shoes. He left without no phone. He left without no coat. He left without no backpack. If he was leaving, running away, every well, I'll tell you a story, years ago, years ago, I'm going back many years, right, when my son was naughty, I'd go, well, I'm taking you to the naughty, naughty boy's home, right, and he would go and get his little backpack, <laughs> and pack his pyjamas in it, and a toy, his favourite toy, come out and put his coat on to go to this naughty boy's home. <laughs> And when I seen him do that, it just cracked me up. 
I mean, don't be silly. Go to your end, put it all away. You're not going nowhere. Right? But it's just the fact that because he thought he was leaving, he went and backpacked a back. Now he's what? How old did he be? Five, six. You know, about four, four, or five. Four or five years old. But at that age, he knew to pack a bag. Now, this is a 15 year old with probably brain mentality of like a 10 year old. But he know if he was going to walk out, leave that home on his own free will, he was running away, he'd backpack a bag. He'd put his switch in there, he'd put his phone in there, he'd put the money in there that he'd been saving up. He'd put shoes on, he'd put a coat on, he'd put a change of clothes maybe on. Yep, and I'm sure as how if he was leaving, he would have messaged his dad, even if he knew he was at work, he would have messaged his dad before leaving, saying, I've had enough dad, I'm leaving, I'm making my way to you, or something like that. Yep, but nothing, there is nothing. I said, aliens should come above the house and just zapped him up because there was no scent apart from one dog that picked up the scent. Now that dog, that scent could have been on the Saturday or the Friday evening or the Thursday before because dogs and wife go up to seven days to pick up a scent. So that scent could have been from the Saturday or before. And I think many times if she's put him outside, she's gone for a walkabout. Right, he's gone off, wandering around. So yes, he would go over to the building site because he likes big machinery. It's been said that he likes the big machinery. So, what young child wouldn't go over there where the big diggers and you name it over there, right? So, I think that scent was from another day. I don't think it's from that day. Because there's no scent of him around that house. There's no scent of him leaving the garage and going down the driveway. Now, if he'd put the rubbish out on the Sunday night, there'd be that scent. But there wasn't. There was no scent. No thing. So, big red flag straight away, all in the first day. An investigation should have been running at the same time as the search. Right? That house check 10 times apparently has it been forensically checked to do a forensic search they have to have um a walking hand done by judge right has that been done on the house has a forensic search a check being done on the cars. Has a forensic search been done on the five wheeler? Has any forensic searches been done on any of the vehicles? Has any forensic searches been done on their phones? Or have they just gone and gone through their messages without going back into them all? You know what I mean? Have they done all that? Because if they haven't, then they have dropped the ball big time. And TBI, I said yesterday, and I'll say it again, when it comes to a complex case, they don't know what they are doing. If it's a straightforward kidnapping, abduction, or the child 
had walked away, left home. It's a straightforward case like that. They know, they know what they're doing. But when it comes to a case where there's no sign of an abduction, there's no sign that he walked away from the house himself. Right? Uh, there's no sign of any um, physical anything going on in the house. They don't know what they're dealing with. What case can I refer to that? Oh yeah, Summer Moon, Utah, Wales. We cannot let this case go like that one. So when the protests were going on that weekend, that guy saying, repaint, repaint about CP. No. No protests are going on at the moment. It's not helping Sebastian. It's not helping find Sebastian. And Chris, why is he going to repent? If he repents, it means he's guilty. Right? He's saying he's not guilty. He's not in it. He's got nothing to do with this. He wasn't there. So what's he got to repent for? Let's listen. Believe in their gut, and it's counter to what I've seen from other parents in the past. You know, in in all the stories, and unfortunately, you see a you've seen this before, where a child goes missing, and you wonder how everyone acts and mm -hmm. acts in that in in the aftermath. If the child is still missing and hasn't been found, um, why would you ever stop looking? How Absolutely. could you ever stop looking? Where are you looking? Um, and, and that's not happening here. And that's, that's troubling for a lot of folks. Um, but at the end of the day, there's a child still missing and not, and, and the child needs to be found. The child could be in danger. Like there, no one knows if, if, if one's in the home, um, you don't know anyone about, about what could have happened here. And, and we're not we're necessarily seeing that. Um, if, if it's okay, one thing I've realized about the Schmidt, the Petito Schmidt family, regardless of their differences, they became a united front. They came together for the combo of trying to find Gabby Petito and get justice for Gabby. We're not seeing this here. And what breaks my heart is that it should be a unified front. They all should be banding together, putting aside their differences and looking at the common goal, getting Sebastian home. Absolutely. Pascal, stay with us. When we come back, we're going to take a look, closer look at Sebastian, and bring in and talk about some of the issues that we've uncovered uh, that Sebastian was suffering from, how all of that could impact what happened to this 15-year-old plus coming up next hour. In Oakland County, Michigan, the parents of the Oxford Room has been You know, my son was missing, and I just started watching, watching body language, listening to words coming out that I formed an opinion. Yeah, I formed an opinion. I am only human. That again, once again, my son, something has happened to my son under her watch. And once again, she wasn't being an adult. She wasn't being a parent parent taking care of an autistic child. That there are problems. It's obvious <coughs> that there are problems here between <coughs> Seth and Katie. That's why they got divorced. Now, they have a child together, a child with autism, and trying to understand these dynamics and, and how that could impact what happened to Sebastian, why he would suddenly, for whatever reason, that it could impact. We dove into the divorce documents between Katie and Seth, because sometimes you go in there, you, you, you can pull out information that may very well shed some more light on this case and Sebastian himself. Take a look on the screen here. Um, in those divorce documents, our son suffers from a rare condition, 6Q27 chromosomal, chromosomal deletion syndrome. 
Among the symptoms he suffers from are incidents of acting out, where he hits and bites himself out of frustration. He's been known to throw himself to the ground during these incidents. So what exactly is this 6Q27? <laughs> how could that impact, how could that impact a, a teenager who's 15 years old? We're going to dig into that right now. Still with me, podcaster Pascal Boboff. Also, also joining us tonight in Los Angeles, California, clinical and forensic neuropsychologist, associate professor at Pepperdine University, and author of The New Rules of a Dr. Judy Ho is with us. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Judy Ho. Let me ask you this. Um, 6Q27, what, what is that? What does that mean? And how could that impact uh, a child um, and then a 15-year-old teenager and someone who's been a child of a divorce? Well, Betty, 6Q27 deletion syndrome is a genetic condition. It's very rare and it's caused by the deletion of a small piece of chromosome 6. So the deletion can vary in size. We don't know more details. And also what we know about this. Oh, John. The five books have left Yogi Bear Camp Grand. Hi, Roxanne. Well, Seth did Sebastian say hi for any others? <coughs> no. I will tell you now. I don't believe that Sebastian ever touched Faith. Tell you what, Seth said himself, whenever Faith was at their house. Sebastian was at his dad's. His dad said, I wasn't going to turn down spending more time with Sebastian. You know what I mean? So, no. I'd say no to that swing because. Sebastian was never at the house when Faith was there. Uh, the Faith books have left you their campground. Did they leave on the free will or was they told to leave? <laughs> I believe the area of how I put five years to look at. It's a big area though, when there. And there's lots of devices round that way that need to be checked. I think they need to go further out. Because if he was where, anywhere near that house in Hendersonville, I'm sure they would have found something by now. But then again, he may still be alive. Remember? Chris was the one who approached Seth about taking Sebastian. Yes, go to two words from Tennessee. Okay. Okay. See, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to tell you about it. the road down there in Scotland. I really wouldn't. Unless I go on them quite often. The only route I take quite often is the route from where I live down to my daughter's. <laughs> I could probably tell you quite a lot about that route, but otherwise, any other route I wouldn't go. But to be, but it's just way away from Tennessee to Mississippi, right? Well, they do need to search it. I agree. They to search it and not just one or two days they need to be spending a good week or more there because there's big areas that someone was saying her husband hadn't even heard of this case wasn't following this case and then you see some youtube thing about it and he said a place and she, you know she was talking to her husband about it and he said i go to and he didn't mention a name of a place, which is on the way from Tennessee to Mississippi. National Refuge. Okay. Hi, Sonia. So, I don't know. But I think it's all got to be covered. And I don't think that search should have been 
I bought after only what eight days. <laughs> oh, God. Don't go there, UFOs exist. Please. Oh my God. <laughs> I believe in UFOs and I believe in another life. Right? But I'm not going to start throwing that lot into this. There's enough going on without the paranormal. But thank you. <laughs> I do believe in the paranormal. I do believe in other forms of life. And I do pray he's alive. I really do. Because he deserves so much more. But you see, it was, as I was saying, it was Chris that approached Seth about taking Sebastian when the summer break started, right? And he said, okay. And with that, he got himself sorted out. I'm sorted out with a school for the following year. FBI and Homeland Security always come in with these paranormal cases. <laughs> Why am I getting these ones come through tonight? Why? I, if you like it or you don't, the artistics are scratch up. If you like it or you don't, the autistics have much greater of, of extraterrestrial contacts. Well, I'll tell you something. Right? My grandson, I've got a photo of the father of my children, his day day on my wall in the hallway. People say, but you you separated, you work together no more, and all this lot. I went, no, true. But he's part of my children's life, right? So anyway, we've got this picture of his granddad up on the wall in the hallway. My grandson comes running out of his bedroom, shouting, Daddy ghost, daddy ghost. Dad come running out of the living room going, What are you going on about, daddy ghost? And the daddy ghost, what it is, is actually seeing his granddad bedroom because his dad, my son, and his father look alike. They're a spitting image of each other. Right? So I believe he, see, he sees his granddad. Now, my other granddaughter, she, I've seen her sitting in the hallway, looking up from the floor up to that photo. And when she, this was before she could talk, and she'd babble on. And I'd watch her from the living room door, and she'd be sitting there looking up at the babbling away to this photo. They took him or he walked into a portal. It's very sad. I don't think so. I don't. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm not saying that. I just don't think it's happened in this time. Right? I think something more sinister has happened. Which is sad. But I do believe that that, that dog picked up on may be come from a Saturday or a day up to seven days before. Right? So how many times did she put him outside as a punishment? Right? And when he's outside as if, well, I'm going for a walkabout. And how many times did he walk about that area? And maybe walked up to that construction site and along to all around that construction site. You don't know. But it is sad. And I do hope he's found alive. I really do. Because then the truth will come out. Anyway, 
no more portals will portal straight back into this this figure. Syndrome is that it's somewhat heterogeneous in presentation. So just depending on how much it's affecting the person, they could display a number of different behavioral difficulties. We saw on that court document that you just showed, Vinny, some of the ones that are specific to Sebastian. But some of the more common ones are some developmental delays in some area of perhaps language or motor skills. Sometimes these individuals have a mild intellectual disability and some cognitive issues. Oftentimes they have social challenges, understand feelings of another person and being able to Some have difficulty with impulse control and managing their anger and more anxious. There are some that suggest there may be an increased risk of autism disorder. So they're not one-to-one, -one, they amplified phases or uh, deletion syndrome. I'm having trouble with my internet. We've been having a bit of bad weather today, some high winds. If I lose you altogether, stay where you are, I'll be straight back on. Just to let you know in case I lose it. Specific incident. And again, this is from papers filed by Seth. On August 11th, 2016, I had told him that day that if he cleaned his room, he could go swimming. I asked him if his room was clean, and he replied that it wasn't. I told him he couldn't go swimming until it was clean. Sebastian reacted by... Well, I just want to see this coming. This live stream and chat are pathetic. You are all parasites. Would you like to explain a bit more for... Please? Flying into a rage, screaming and hitting himself, biting himself, and trying to throw himself on the floor. I reached out to catch him before his head, knowing that he is a child with autism. You kind of put that together. Now he's 15 years old, you know, going through those changes as well. He's, yeah. in, the, he's in the middle eye on a lot of things. Um, what are your thoughts about how all of that could play a role in, in many during the teenage years we know that our young people are going through a number of different transitions they're trying to figure out who they are their identity their place in life they're grappling with issues of self-esteem and what they're going to do in the future so that's already a stressful time for everyone but now we have these additional stressors mom and dad possibly not getting along um trying to figure out you know how to essentially in the middle as you're seeing potential co-parenting difficulties you know individuals even if they're not communicating them directly they're still feeling the pressure they're still feeling the difference from these parental arguments and so it's a potentially very stressful time an additionally stressful time for sebastian there could have been a number of other things that have come up maybe his emotions so i just think that there's so much more that we have to uncover because there's way more than meets the eye. I heard your conversation with Pascal earlier. feels like some of the information, as we mentioned before, there was a I was at that CPS call. Why was biological father Seth not notified of the podcast? Um, there's something here that we don't know about, and we have so much more to find out. Pascal, in your conversations with uh, uh, Sebastian's dad, Seth, um, did this come up? Did he talk a lot about... The, the stress between his family, between him and, and Katie, and issues of custody and, and where this child was going to stay, and whether or not there was something happening around this time, I'm some sort of a change in that relationship? Well, honestly, the conversations that we've had on the show, a lot of it has just been him saying, hey, as soon as school is over, Sebastian's coming over, he'll be with me from that point on. So there hasn't really been much detail about any type, or any type of tension between the three of them or anything of that sort. So the only part that became a moment of tension was when he found out about the CPS being called after the belt incident on Sebastian. And he was like, I just didn't know about any of that. I just found out through the podcast, like we just said a second ago. And he was absolutely shocked. He, he obviously was very upset, very moved, very perturbed over that information, but he didn't say much. He was fairly 
diplomatic about now some questions for antique YouTube questions that he uh, he sat there and was has told me he doesn't want to go back. He just don't want to go back. It's you know at that point in time I'm I'm just like okay well maybe it's the freedom that he gets in my house. Dr. Judy Ho, there's lots of reasons why a 15-year-old may want to stay with one parent over the other. Free. Same child now disappears. I think this becomes much more significant. That's exactly right. Um, another in these mixed households, child is going to show a preference over living in one house. It's just through. But like you said, the CPS call disappearing. Some potentially strange behaviors from mother and stepfather. Again, everybody behaves differently. Everybody deals with stress differently but i think a lot of people are saying well why are you not staying close why are you in this church? even are afraid social pressures around you isn't the biggest priority to find your son make sure that he's okay i think one more thing bring up this causing us to question exactly what was going on in this household right before he disappeared uh any comment chris prager asked Seth if he wants to sebastian full time yes and the week of trial for Chris to get custody of his daughter. He goes missing. Hmm. I see where you're coming from. But I don't see how that would help his case. You know what I mean? How, how the fact that Sebastian's gone missing, how is that going to help him with getting his daughter full time? Which obviously it hasn't. I mean, we know Chris didn't want his daughter to blame Sebastian. We know that Seth has said whenever the daughter came to visit, right, Sebastian would go to Seth. And now Seth is not going to give up on spending time with his son. But every time Faith came round to visit, come up to visit, Sebastian went to his dad. And he said the one time he came, he spent two hours on the phone with Faith. I don't think Sebastian would ever hurt someone else. This is just Chris's warped mind. You know what I mean? Trying to make out that Sebastian is something he isn't. Well, Sebastian is not just a victim. He's a survivor. He survived that and he will survive what's happening to him now. If he's still alive, he's a survivor. And he's saying the truth will come out. <coughs> yes, it will. One way or the other, the truth is going to come out, DP. And as Steph said, they haven't got that interview. I was so proud to be when I seen that interview. I was yes about time. When he come up to the camera and said, I told you, you keep pushing my buttons and I will go. And he did. He let loose. Because he'd rather talk about the essay than have Chris gleefully talk about it. As though his son a peed a pee, Peter. You know what I mean? <coughs> so, <coughs> pardon me. So, so, that's, so Seth got in, got in there first. Um, the fact that uh, said, no one would want to look for your son if I was to tell him what happened. What sort of guy is going to say that? This is a child. He needs help. Right? A child that needs to be, oh, well, he's a pedo, so we won't look for him. He's a child. Right? I was once asked once, 
when I came in between a mother who lived up the road from me and a young girl that lived next door to me, right? Her mother was had gone out coming up. And this mother had come down and started arguing with the young girl. So I've come out and I've stood in between the two of them. Because I thought, oh, Tom, this is a teenager and you're a grown woman. Why are you arguing with a teenager? And this woman's turned around and said, why are you sticking up for this family after everything they've done and put your family through? And I turned around and said, because at the end of the day, she's a child. Whatever problems I have with the family, I don't take it out on the children. I have words with the family, the mother or the father, I will not take it out on the children. And But Chris is the opposite. He will take it out on the children. He don't care. As long as it makes him look good, he doesn't care. Anyway, we still got a little bit longer. How much longer? 31. Quickly watch this now. And Pascal, the other thing is happening, the more that, and you said this off, off the top, right? The, the, the deeper you go into the, the interpersonal relationships and issues that the adults in Sebastian's life have, whether he disappears voluntarily or whether something happened that made him disappear, it just seems that there are things in the lives of these three adults um, that this child just vanished for no, no reason. Absolutely. Honestly, was, there's a lot going on, as you just said. There's a lot going on in this family, this, this blend family, if you will. Um, and Billy, right, because couldn't stand bouncing back and forth like on how other. There is a possibility of like thing with his father, the with foots. That's a possibility. On. Yeah, it's the old news cliche. More questions than answers. But but it continues, and, and and all the questions are really come down to one question: like where's Sebastian? Mm -hmm. Pascal Buff. Make sure you check him out on YouTube. You have to wait. End the show. Go to Path. Download. Watch his live streams. Awesome stuff. Dr. Judy Ho, great to see you. Make sure you grab the book. Uh, when we come back, folks, we're going to focus on some of the water searches. There's a lot of water in that area. Not big bodies of water, but enough. That's next. Hint. We're not ruling anything out. All right, I get it. <laughs> not ruling it out. It seems they don't really have the leads, the evidence. They just concluded another search last last Friday. So where are we in all this? I want to show you the map another time because this is again this is significant in all of this uh, in in terms of whether or not there are clues, whether a scent was picked up, whether or not water searches um, are are the key right now in, in this in this area, and how wide of a scope will you go? Chris Proudfoot was interviewed uh, by Nancy Grace, and this is what he said. He said there have been dogs from all over the country that have come in and done searches and had scent hits in various locations. But I can say a certain percentage of them tend to go towards the same spot, which would have been a retention pond. At least three that I know for a fact that did hit on the retention pond. What does that mean? Joining us tonight from the United Cajun Navy, Kevin LaFon, and in Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. Great to have you both back. Not the United Cajun Navy. Oh, give me strength. Kevin LaFon, you can go to hell. I, as I said, Sebastian could have walked up with that. Hold on, I'll just take it back and I'll stop it there, where it was. To this. Right? He could join that path a week before, or all the days before, where if his mum's put him outside, Whatever's going on, he's probably walked and walked up this way up to here 
And that's where the entrance is. And this is where all the work's going on. Right? Now, it's probably just been going around this area and looking around and everything. Going to the cemetery. I used to love going, I tell you, when I was a child, I used to love going to this one cemetery. So, I just find them very relaxing and peaceful, even now. Peaceful and relaxing. So, if I want to go somewhere where I don't want to be disturbed, I can guarantee you I'll go to a cemetery and sit on a Rather than go to a park where there's children running about and people passing dogs, I'd rather just go to a cemetery and sit on a bench. And sit there and watch. She like Bobby. So he could go over there many times. So I'm not going to listen to the rest of it because it's got UK, United Kings and Navy in it. And I don't like them. <laughs> I just think they are fake. And as for helping in this case, they haven't helped. They put a lot of hindrance in this case. Right? Because even Nancy said when they first came on her show, and you say, they didn't want them doing any live videos. And I said, no, 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 no. I want to see the live videos. I don't want to see pre-recorded videos. But I can understand where he's coming from. Right? So I don't want someone coming in, going live, and then someone is found, something is found, and then going up with their cameras just for the clicks and views. I don't agree with that either. Right? And I did say, okay, so all you YouTubers, you want to go and help. Go and help. If you want a video, video it and then edit it afterwards. People will still watch your video, whether it's live or recorded, pre recorded. Right? But I know JLR went on a couple of times on searches and when anything was stopped, when the when that line of people was stopped, he would stand right back until he knew it was safe enough for him to go forward. And he said if it comes out there is a person, then it would put the live completely. So, but you've got these unscrupulous ones that go on TikTok or whatever. I won't say YouTubers because there's a lot of really, really good YouTubers that have got good scruples, you know what I mean, who would stand back and would put the live if anything did happen. But you've got these TikTokers that go on, or, and they go on live on Facebook and Things like that. I don't believe in them. I don't. I think they are out for the money, for the views, for the clicks. I don't. And I never will. People, I, I've looked at someone yeah, and call me a tragic thing because I don't get anything for this. I don't get nothing. And even if I could, I wouldn't. Because you can get to choose what videos you get, you can have monetized when the time comes. I can choose to have this video. Say, say I wanted to. I could say, right, any video, any live I do on Sebastian, I'm not going to have, have it monetized. Right? And I can choose what lives I have monetized and what lives I don't. So... But I don't know, there's just something about 
some unscrupulous people. And those are the ones that are giving YouTubers, good YouTubers, a bad name. Anyway, I've been on it two and a half hours. So I'm going to have to go because I've got to have the medication. Anyway, I would just like to say thank you for all those in live stream, even for who made this comment of this live stream and chat are pathetic. And you know what, so you know where the door is. Boom. I've just shown it yeah. Just showing him. I think everyone's got a right to their comments and their opinion. But we don't come on here and call us parasites because we're not. We're not parasites. I'm out here purely for the children. I said that in my very first live I did. I'm here for the children. And that is it. I don't really care about Chris and Katie. I don't care where they've moved to. I don't want to know where they've moved to. I want to know where Sebastian is. As for the mother and the stepfather, I couldn't give two bits. I want to know where Sebastian is. So then Seth, the father, can have some relief. Um, time where we can just right? We don't know if he did his um, polygraph today because that was something else that was in the title. He's supposed to do a polygraph today. Don't know if that's been done. I did see some up, come up about Trev time asking about Nancy Grace that he's done the polygraph. But Seth's got nothing to hide. So he'll, he'll say, yes, I've done the polygraph. And Nancy will show the polygraph. Well, she won't show it, but she'll, she'll say whether he passed or not. Because he's got nothing to hide. They don't know where he was. But when Seth, Chris sits there and says, well, law enforcement didn't need me to take a polygraph because of where I was. Where was that, Chris? Where was you between four, nine p.m. Sunday night and 6 a.m. Monday morning? Where was you? Is a video camera to prove that you didn't leave the uh, caravan park where you was? Is there? I don't know. You could give you someone else's car. You could have had someone come and pick you up. Such as your mummy and get daddy. So you, you, your car not leaving the caravan park is nothing. There's nothing. So yes, I'd, if I was law enforcement, I'd, say I'd be saying, I'd like you to take a polygraph. But he's got every right to not take a polygraph. That is his right. And constitutional right is that right in America? So if you don't have all that over there, if you don't take a you don't have to take a polygraph. If you don't, then they think why not? And then their suspicions they just start looking into you a lot more if you say no to a polygraph over here. Because right? their opinion is you've got nothing to hide. But please dispatches that KK. I've listened to that one where it was on about the first day where the uh, phone call went in and the dispatch calls put out and then police dog picked up on a scent. But as I said, that scent could have come from the Saturday. If she had a habit of putting Sebastian outside as a punishment, he could have been put outside on a Saturday. Or even on the Friday night after school. 
you know what I mean? And he's probably thought, I'm going to go for a walk and walked around the area and walked up towards the construction site. That, that scent could have been from any night. I will not say it's from Monday morning. Not Monday morning. Because I didn't pick his scent up going down with the rubbish, did I? But I picked his scent up, one dog picked his scent up going up to the construction site. And, you, and Chris says there's three dogs, but to my knowledge, and even Seth said he was told one dog. So, but as I said, he could have gone up there Saturday or even Friday night. And then around, being nosy, seeing what's going on. So, I don't care too much about that place, that dog picking up that thing, because it could have been from any day. If so, the dog had picked up a scent going from the garage to the bottom of the driveway, because that's where the rubbish bins were took out on the Sunday night. And if they had the scent of him coming from the house to the bus stop, which he used to get the bus to school, then I'd be okay. There's scent about the house, about around the area of Sebastian. But the only scent they picked up was one dog. It took him up to the water retention on the, I'm not sure, it was that first water retention on the building side or the second one by the cemetery. I think it was this one I was into, and I believe it was that one they drained. I'm not sure though, just my belief. But as I said, if they picked up his scent going to walking back and forth to the bus stop and taking the rubbish out and things like that, then I'd say, yeah, okay, if the dog's picked up a scent, he could have walked out that house then. You know what I mean? But for one dog just to pick his scent up and take him up to the construction site and then lose the scent, there's no more scent. Let's take those footprints. These houses here, there's more houses there than what it shows on that map. More houses there. Right? Um, it could have been from any of those children living there. I think if I lived on a place like that where they're still in construction, building houses, construction site going on, with a, a young child, I'd have trouble keeping my child in the garden. He'd be wanting to go around the building site. So there's numerous reasons why there's footprints around that, those water retention ponds and whatever. And as I said, that scent could have come from any day, up to seven days beforehand. The dog can pick up a scent up to seven days before or seven days after. So, anyway, I'm going to leave that. But thank you, KK. I have listened to it. It is on my live. Um, thank you, Jason. Thank you, Thor. Even though I showed you the door. UFO exists. Coming in and throwing some portal information out there. And Roxanne and Swimp and Sonia and Tracy. Thank you all for being here tonight. And everyone on X, thank you all for being here tonight. I'm sure there's better things you could be doing with your two and a half hours than sitting and listening to me going on. So anyway, I will be back on tomorrow. Then I'll, that will be my last live tomorrow night until Sunday. Because I'm Friday and Saturday I've got my...
pudding. So I will see you tomorrow night, same time, 8 p.m. UK time, whatever time it is in the USA for you, but 8 p.m. UK time, and I'll see you all then. Thank you all for being here. Night.